You know, I, I'm always amazed. Brian is such an excellent communicator. Have you guys noticed the way he uses superlatives? And um, I, I once heard about his wife, Terry, making a meal. And as Brian talked about the meal, most of us say, hey, honey, this is really good. This was a spectacular, super meal, exceeding all of my expectations. It couldn't be better. Brian is the kind of guy that you want to be around if you're just a little bit down. He has a way of building you up with those superlatives. Well, thank you, Brian. Hey, let's look now into God's Word. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 11, the 11th verse. While, while you're moving toward the text, I, I would like to share with you one word that capsulizes the essence of the message, and it is simply confidence, confidence. One of the things that happens in aging naturally is that once you reach the age of 60, studies, secular studies, have proven that our confidence as people diminishes. The older we get, less confidence. And so what I do know is that for many people who are in my, in my generation are experiencing some less confidence in life than what we possessed earlier. But the other thing I've learned is that it's not just boomers who are diminished in confidence, but there's a lot of people in this day in which we're living where there is a lack of confidence. Now, please, let's not confuse what I'm going to be pointing us toward with arrogance, being full of yourself. That's not at all anything that's godly. That's pride, and pride led to the fall of all humanity. And so what we're going to be talking about is a sense of spiritual confidence that I truly believe God wants you and me to possess. Because when we have confidence in our God and his ability to do his will in and through us, then we navigate through life so much better and we're more courageous to do ministry in his name. Pick up with me now, verse 11. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. What John is simply saying in that statement is, let me throw down the same truth I've been giving to you. Remember, John, the writer, is approximately 90 years old. He was the youngest of our Lord's disciples. So he's saying, after a half century I've not deviated, I've not gone off the rails, I'm giving you the truth just like I received it from our Lord. Now verse 12, here we have the introduction of a personality, a person who is the prototype of what I would characterize as two broad categories of humanity. In this world, there are two broad categories. One category are life takers, and the other category is life givers. There are people who bring life into this world. They bring goodness. They bring truth. And then there are people who are bringing death, and they take life. Which are you? A life giver, a life taker. Which one are you? Now, we're told about a life taker first. And his name in verse 12, it's given to us right at the beginning. His name was Cain. And you re not raising Cain. You're hungry, right? Anyway, the Cain that we're talking about was the sibling of Abel. One of the two boys mentioned in chapter 4, a son of Adam and Eve. And you'll remember that Cain, we're told, was a farmer. He's a farm boy. And he was a tiller of the land. And we're told that the other son was Abel. Abel was a shepherd. We know that both on occasion in Scripture are viewed with high regard. So this is not about an occupation. This is about obedience to God. Remember, in 1 John, there are three themes which are throughout. It is woven into the fabric of the text repeatedly. And the theme is 
You can have security spiritually. You can know that you're born again if you maintain the truth about Jesus Christ. Remember, there was a group of people who misrepresented the truth about Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved by any old name. You cannot revise the name Jesus and make him into what you want him to be and be saved. It is the historic Jesus Christ. It is the Jesus Christ who descended from heaven down to earth, who willfully went to the cross to pay a price for sin that we cannot pay, who was placed in a grave, he was dead. And he rose again from the grave on the third day. He ascended to the Father, and he's coming back. And so this is the Jesus. And if you do any tweaks, get a little cute with Jesus, make him what you want him to be, most likely you're not born again. Now, so the orthodoxy about Jesus is one of the key fabrics. Secondly, it is obedience. Read through the book. Double dog dare you. Just read through it. You're going to see repeated references to obedience. You might say, oh, does he have some redemption and salvation wrong? It's all of grace. Of course it is. But people who have the new birth want to obey their father, and they don't believe that their obedience maintains their salvation, but it is the evidence of a changed heart that has this strong, passionate affection for the Lord of their life, obedience. And then thirdly, you're going to see a love for the brothers and the sisters. Do you have a heart? Do you have a heart? Are you unmoved by the pain and the suffering of the people around you? Are you heartless? You can be orthodox. You can memorize every one of these verses on the wall. You can also know our doctrinal statement, the Baptist faith and message, 2001, and agree to every aspect of our doctrinal statement. And if you don't have a heart, you can know his word, but you don't know him. And so we find that John says, if you have a genuine love that is driven by our Lord, you should have an assurance of yourself. If you are obedient to his commandments, because every son delights in being obedient to the will of their good father, and if as well you understand the truth of the historic Christ, who was and is and forever will be, then you've got the real thing. But don't, don't tell God we're okay with each other when you're doing none of those three. So now we see Cain. What happens with Cain? He, gets, he gives an offering to God, as does Abel. Scripture says... God received the offering of Abel, but he rejected the offering of Cain. What happened to Cain? This made him angry. Cain then took his anger out in a way that led to the death of his brother. I'd like for us, if we would, just for a moment or two, look at the dialogue where God speaks. We're given this, this insight. It's almost like the room is bugged, and we're given this, this record of the dialogue between God and Cain. This is before he would kill his brother. Envy, anger. Notice what God does. Chapter 4 of the book of Genesis and if you would, start with me in the sixth verse. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious? I, 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 I understand. People come to church, and we want people to come to church, even when they're not emotionally well. 
We want you to be here. We want this to be a place of healing. We want you to see this as a refuge. But we don't want you to live in the dysfunction of that emotion that is so adverse to your life. And so my question would be, why are you angry? Why, why is it that your wife would characterize you, I'm married to an angry man? Why, why would your husband say of you, I don't understand her. She is always angry. Why, God says to Cain, are you angry? He's not wasting time. When the Spirit speaks to us through the Word, it is so that we might be drawn to God's healing and His mercy and His grace in your life. And what we don't want to do is to cover it and to fake it and to come into church. We put the mask on and we fool some people, but we never fool God. Why are you so angry? And notice next in the text, and why do you look so despondent? You have the look of despair that there is no hope. This can, I can never move beyond this. I can never be healed. My life can never get better. I can never get rid of this rage inside of me. And, and then it says this in verse 7. If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? That is, that in my mind is one of the great grace verses in all of the Old Testament. You blew it. Most likely God laid out what was an acceptable offering and an unacceptable offering. Abel got it right. Cain didn't get it right. But that did not mean for the rest of his life, Cain had to be the rejected son. So what does God say? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's just start over. Let's do it right the next time. Do you know what that is? That's grace. That is grace. Because of your prior decisions that were in opposition to the will of God, you can break the cycle. You can be healed. You can be forgiven. There is mercy. And, and, and then listen to this. Oh, what an incredible warning. If only he had listened to God. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. I, I don't know if that grips your soul like it grips mine. That God is giving this advance warning. Cain, listen, if you don't deal with this anger, if you continue to live in denial, if you allow it to continue to fester, it's not going to end well. And, and so listen, you need to understand the peril with which you are living if, if anger is unresolved, if, if the emotion that is so damaging, you think that this is just something everyone has to acclimate to in your life, you don't understand, Cain. This can get so much worse. And, and then notice this. Its desire is for you. It wants to own you. It wants to own you. It wants to be your master. It wants to enslave you. But notice this. God says it doesn't have to be this way. But, but, but you must rule over it. There is a way for it to get better. There is a way that your anger, your hate, your rage, that is not what God wants and intends for your life. 
Don't follow that script. Life taker. Cain is a life taker. All of us have these Dracula people in our lives. And, and sometimes we'll, we'll joke about it. Um, people that suck the life, the blood, out of our life. This is literally a person who because they aren't dealing with their life the way God would want them to brings death. A life giver. Look with me at verse 16. Jesus is the personification of being a life giver. This is how we have come to know love. In other words, there's an aspect of this word that everybody is searching for in their everyone wants everyone wants love and to be loved. They want they they want to experience love and they want to be loved. This drives all kinds of activities. And so what, what he is saying is there's a level of love you cannot plunge into apart from God. And it says this is what we, we, have come, we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And then what does John say? We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This has been a crazy week at Jersey. And we've had four deaths in the church this past week. Of one of the families, this incredible family in our church, uh, they're, they're always on the front row. And they're generous, uh, they're teaching, they're investing in the lives of people. They're small business owners. They work really hard. Uh, the wife, Jan, had just been to their, their shop, and she came back and she said, man, Marty is amazing. She said, that woman runs the shop. And she was more than impressed just seeing her in that environment. But every Sunday, when I come up from the catacombs, the lower level of the chapel, and I walk through that door, I look and her husband is there. He's the kind of guy who's kind of got that effervescent personality, you know, smiles at me. I'm like, oh, good, safe environment. His wife is just one of these spiritual giants. I mean, she, I always felt like, okay, I don't even want to sit in front because she, she just connects with Jesus when she is in this place. And, and I'm like, I, no, I'm not going to interrupt her because, I mean, she is meeting with Jesus. And, and, and not in, a, in a, any negative way. And so a little over a week ago, she wasn't feeling well. She goes to the hospital and is diagnosed with systemic cancer. I knew they needed a little space, but on Friday, I got the word that things weren't going well. And so I decided, I said, Jan, let's go, baby. Let's, let's go to the hospital. So we went. And the husband looks at me and he says, um, John, in the midst of all of this suffering and pain, God is so good. I'm getting to take her home so that she can die at home. At 5.30, we're going to leave. And later that evening, I got a message and he said, we left at 5.30 and at 8.30, she went to be with Jesus in her home. You know, Jan and I, when, when, when that happens, um, first of all, we hug each other tight, okay? Um, we realize that life is brief. It's, James would say it's like a vapor, here now and gone. And, and then we're like, what can we do? You know, what can we do? Of course we prayed. The next day, a brother calls me and he says, John, listen, what can we do? And I asked the question. I said, how about the yard? Um, is it being cared for? And the man who had just been to the house that Saturday morning said, hey, it was freshly cut. And then listen to this. A neighbor cut the grass. And I'm going, I don't know who that neighbor is, but I like him. 
I like her, I like him, whoever that is. I, I've got so much more to grow in, in 10,000 ways. But I will tell you this, my heart is moved by the pain and the suffering, especially of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And if in your heart, when that person, your neighbor, your coworker, the person in your small group, the RD member that you've invested in, when their life absolutely gets sucker punched, and if you don't care, if you're unmoved, if there isn't something that says to you in some way, no matter how small, I want to do something to remind that brother and sister Jesus has never abandoned you. He never will. He is with you in this journey of suffering. And, and, and what John is saying to us, he's saying to me, he's saying to you, we all, every one of us can look at the way last week we broke some commandment. We all know that there was a way that we had an encounter with someone that we could have made their life better, but we chose otherwise. But what John is saying is, if it never happens... And if you never care, if you never weep, if you never cry, if you never stay up at night, if you're unmoved, there's a serious problem with your soul because the heartbeat of Jesus has always been and will always be where there is sin, where there's the ravages of a fallen world. He is there and he cares. So, two ways to live in this life. You can be a life taker who lives without compassion. If, look at verse 17. If anyone has the world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? And, you know, I'm, I'm, it's 7.30 and I get a phone call and it's a phone call from the, the family member who's connected to some people who've had a horrible night. The mother of three children has lost it. Hasn't done harm to the children, but harm to herself. Uh, someone who's associated with that household has two outstanding warrants for his arrest. Police call someone who calls me. The mother's been taken to the hospital. The kids are here. A neighbor came over and was sitting with the children, and she brought, I don't know why stuff like this sticks in my mind, she brought this box of Ritz crackers, and she was giving the crackers to the children. And, and this, this neighbor again, I was just like, what the face of Jesus? You know, just caring for these kids that she never had to. And, and, and then arriving there and feeling so inadequate in, in 10,000 ways, but looking into the eyes of those children and God saying to me something, you have to be a part of their redemption. There has to be something, John, that you can do to help them in the midst of this incredible crisis that they're going through. I, I don't have the answer. I don't have the solution. All I know is that God has clearly said in some way, John, this is going to involve you. 
What experience have you had this past week? And, 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 and a couple of our, our church family were here on Wednesday. They're driving down Morris Road. They look over in the road, in the ditch, and there's a woman face down in the ditch. Thank God there was another church member driving behind this woman uh, from our church, had been here for rehearsal with music. And so they gathered the woman together who was struggling with some form of, of addiction who had said she was asked to do a sexual favor and was kicked out of the car into the ditch. The church members did exactly what I think Jesus wanted them to do. They gathered her together. They brought her back here to the church. They were able to make contact with family members and did their very best to try to, to, try to get her into a safe place. I don't know about you, but I think the church at Jersey is being tested in a lot of ways. Are we going to respond to people with need, with compassion, and be life givers? Or are we going to look the other way and be life takers? Now, now there's, to move quickly, there, there's another portion of this message. Remember, I talked to you about confidence. Look with me, if you would. Beginning in verse 19, it says this. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Basically, whether or not you are, you are moved or unmoved, God knows. And it's not dependent upon what we might say is a conscience. But look at verse 21. Dear friends, if your heart doesn't condemn you, if it doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God. I, I, I would say to you, I'm, I'm still trying to navigate through these experiences that I've had this past week to say, God, did I, did I do it right? Are you happy with me? But when, when, I, when I think about this past week and I think about the future and I think about our church, I think about the fact that we as a congregation, if we're going to be able to, to thrive and represent Jesus well into the future, there must be an anchor that, that holds us fast. Because this kind of stuff can wear you down. It's exhausting. It's, it, it, if, if your heart is, is not made of stone, you will cry, you will weep, you will question, you, 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 you can't do otherwise. And so how is it that we, we can have a firm anchor to have confidence in the midst of a broken world where sometimes I'm haunted by a question once when I was leading a, a, a mission trip where I was meeting with a missionary in an extremely hard place and, and he looked at me and with honesty he said, I know God is greater than any of this evil. But he said this, he said, why do I see evil winning so much? And I'm like, brother, persevere. Somehow persevere. So how do we persevere? I think John gives us three ways. Let's look at it together. It, it, first of all, he gives us assurance of salvation. Verse 19, this is how we will know that we belong to the truth. That, I don't know how anyone navigates through life without knowing if I were to die today, where does my soul go for eternity? Does it go to heaven? Does it go to hell? And if I have no certainty about that, when life can be threatening, when life can be harsh, when life can be bad, when you get the diagnosis that you've got cancer, when they tell you you only have hours, days to live, you have to know that you know that you have peace with your Creator. 
and you can. And then secondly, I think God wants us as well to know that prayer does change things. Notice what he says in verse 22. And receive whatever you ask from him because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Then you know 1 John 5 uh, verses, uh, verses 14 and 15. And, and in that passage, it says, this is the confidence that we have before God. This is the confidence that we have before God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You can have the ear of the Almighty. And, and so when, when we navigate through life and its difficulties and its adversity, what God is saying, listen, don't ever let anyone minimize the impact and the power of believing prayer in the, anchored in the will of, the, of God. And then thirdly, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, look with me at verse 24. The one who keeps his commands, that, that repetitiveness, isn't it? The commandments of God, we obey him, we obey him. Remains in him and he in him. And the way that we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given to us. Three ways. God gives us assurance of our salvation. No matter how bad it might be, no matter how threatening the environment to minister in, that's how missionaries have the courage to leave this safe place and go to some place where their lives are in peril. They are assured of their salvation. Secondly, the power of prayer. Prayer changes things. It can change the family. It can rescue those. There is power in prayer. And, and I, I, I so many times, you know, we, we've got young men that we're raising up and young women in ministry and it's kind of like, oh, you know, invest time in them so you can help them to know with all your experience. I never feel adequate in myself. Take all of that experience. Take all the hospital rooms, all the times I've sat down and said, your son or your daughter didn't make it. I, I, when I walk in, my flesh is so unreliable. But what gives me the courage to go ahead and go is I never go alone. Christ dwells in me through his spirit. And what John is saying, you can have confidence in this life. Be assured of your salvation. You can. Know that there's power to change. Everyone wants to do something. And for that lady, yes, it was crackers. There's more we can do. And then finally, his spirit dwells inside of us. And he never leaves us. And we never do ministry by ourselves. Church, it's been a rough week. And you know what? There's going to be more. Are we up to it? Not in the flesh. But I'm confident we are when we lean into the knowledge of his saving us, that there is power in prayer, and his spirit will lead us and empower us. Let me pray with you. Father, uh, thank you for uh, the call uh, to ministry that we all receive when we embrace you as Lord. I pray, God, that during this time of decision, your spirit will work in our midst to bring your encouragement. We all acknowledge that sometimes ministry and being Jesus is, uh, is hard. It's difficult. And we do um, get tired. But we trust that you will carry us through. And so, God, I pray that we'll lean into that assurance of salvation. We'll lean into the knowledge that there's power in prayer. We'll lean into the fact 
that you are with us, that your spirit lives in us. And because of you, we are able. Have your way in your church at Jersey, God. You must be preparing us. You must be preparing us for even impacting this world in a greater way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.